I will speak about uh, two optical illusions, uh, mirages and a certain strange kind of mirror. And, uh, uh, and, and the first part is about mirage, uh, mirages and uh, it's inspired by uh, a paper I read many years ago by C.V. Raman and the great C.V. Raman and his nephew uh, Sivaraj uh, Rama uh, Pancharatnam. Uh, it concerns mirages. You've all seen reflections on a rough, dry road on a hot day. Uh, it uh, looks as though uh, there's water on the road, but of course uh, there, is, there is not. Um, and the standard explanation, which is correct, is that this is total reflection from the hot air, which is less dense, the hot air near the road. So here, here's the picture. And uh, here you see the, the viewer seeing the object directly, but also reflected from the heated uh, layer. Now, uh, the mechanism of this reflection is that it's really refraction. You know that rays bend towards a denser medium, and the denser medium is the cooler air above the hot uh, road. And uh, so there's the picture uh, locally. Uh, it's a smooth bending, uh, but it gives the illusion of being reflection from a sharp uh, mirror. Now, Raman disagreed with this interpretation. I was quite astonished when I read this paper. The theory of the mirage, which is usually accepted, purports to base itself on geometrical optics but it is inadequate and unsatisfactory and a kind of make-believe, he wrote. Here's the reason. A pencil of rays traveling obliquely through the stratified medium would, according to Snell's law of refraction, be progressively deviated until it reaches a layer at which its course becomes tangential to the plane of the stratifications. Thereafter, it would continue on a course parallel to the stratifications no question of total reflection can therefore arise. Now, this is a mistake, and it's a mistake which I'll explain the origin of later, but it's an, actually an old mistake, which I think Raman did not realize. Uh, there were doubts about this so-called level ray. Uh, in 1873, the brother of Lord Kelvin, James Thompson, tried to discover whether a ray of light passing infinitely nearly horizontally will be bent with a finite curvature or not at all. Now, he gave a correct argument, but he was still worried there's something perplexing or not quite satisfactory to the mind in taking this final step to the perfectly level ray. For as soon as the inclination of the ray becomes zero, the whole foundation and framework fails, there being then no oblique passage of a ray from one lamina into another. Um, and 1856 described the mistake of supposing that a ray can pursue a straight course parallel to planes of equal index in a continuously varying medium. And he refers to uh, papers long ago, 1799, 1800, uh, which appears to have been forgotten. Wollaston wrote, for each ray, will be bent towards the denser strata by a refracting force proportioned to the difference of the densities above and below the line of its passage. This is indeed correct. And this connection with force goes right back to Newton. The analogy of particles, the trajectories of bodies, which are extremely like the trajectories of rays. Well, why did I know that Raman was wrong? I mean, imagine a, a mechanical analog. You throw a ball obliquely. Uh, this uh, would uh, uh, rise and then become horizontal. And according to Raman's argument, it would never fall down again. Well, it's clearly wrong, but it's very subtly wrong. And uh, it, it's in a way that uh, I will explain in a, in a while. Now, first of all, where does this bending come from? Well, Snell's law conservation of horizontal ray momentum. If the refractive index is mu and uh, the angle with the horizontal is theta, Snell's law is that mu cos theta is a constant and I've chosen the constant to be the place where the ray is horizontal. Um, okay, now differentiate this with respect to height, z. 
And then you have to do a bit of analysis. I won't go into it, uh, but uh, you choose coordinates along the ray and perpendicular to the, across the ray. And then this differentiated form of Snell's law becomes the following well-known uh, uh, result. For the curvature of the ray is the logarithmic derivative of the refractive index perpendicular to the ray. And that's a standard and correct argument. If you apply this uh, uh, locally to the refractive index is varying just linearly near the horizontal ray, then you find, and I don't expect you to follow all details of this, you follow that the ray is locally parabolic. Very good, this is correct. Now, to understand Raman's mistake, and I'm careful to say Raman's mistake and not Pancharatnam's mistake, and you will understand why later, um, you have to realize that what Raman had in mind was approximating the atmosphere by a collection of discrete layers in which the refractive index is constant. So there's the picture. So he thought of this ray bending, 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 very, very small um, intervals, thickness of the layers of order uh, thickness delta. And this is what uh, he had uh, in mind. Um, just a second, I want to remove this. Yeah, never mind. Um, now, it's so you have these different uh, 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 layers at discrete heights. So this is a discrete model of this continuous refractive index. Sorry, the, it's a discrete model, and uh, at uh, intervals of n delta. And in particular, um, you've got Snell's law, which governs the ray track refractive index times. Uh, um, uh, the angle cosine is constant at, at every uh, uh, refraction between trans every transition between one level and another. And there's a critical layer, uh, which is the layer where um, you would have horizontal motion. This is between layers offset by some gamma. And that depends on exactly how you choose the stratifications. We'll have to look very carefully at this discrete model. Well, the horizontal position of the capital N, which would be the, the, the symmetry point, plus mth segment, so you're looking beyond here or behind, depends on this offset gamma uh, of the critical ray. It's something gamma is between zero and one. Um, okay, and it turns out this is critical, but we'll understand why. Now, you can do some analysis. You make a local expansion close to this uh, uh, point. And uh, uh, it turns out that the offset, the horizontal position of the mth ray from the symmetrical ray is um, this critical value plus a sum over all of the refractions thereafter. It involves a constant, which is this uh, small uh, uh, delta and uh, involves the derivative of the refractive index, and it involves this particular sum. Now, we want to take a continuum limit of delta going to zero. Now, if gamma is not too close to one, you can replace the sum by an integral, and then you get the parabola, which, uh, uh, which you would expect. You need to check something. You need to check the reflection at the layers, because the discreteness is, a, is an artifact that you've introduced, and indeed, at the critical layer, the total the reflection is total. Uh, that's standard. That uh, confirms what you expect. And above the critical layer, in the limit of small um, stratifications, the reflections are, are zero. So that's it's correct. So the ray just bends uh, thereafter. And, and you can study the convergence onto the parabola. I've heard some little simulations here. If delta is 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.02, 0 0.001, you see your, the discreetly refracted track converges onto the parabola that the correct theory predicts. However, if you choose a gamma very close to one, in other words, you choose um, uh, a stratification such that uh, the critical uh, uh, layer is very close to where the continuum would project the rays horizontal. The convergence is extremely slow. So here it is, 0.1, and look, there's this huge offset here, but you do converge eventually, but rather very, very slowly. Now, this is Raman's near horizontal ray. It does exist 
in this model of stratifications, but only uh, for, for certain values of this offset, mathematically it's non-uniform convergence, and the measure of these stratifications um, uh, uh, goes to zero as the uh, thickness of the uh, layers goes to zero. So the continuum survives, but you see here the origin of Raman's mistake. This never actually happens because you're always in the continuum uh, limit. So that's the that's the the mistake, and I'll come back uh, later to what was not a mistake in their paper. Several things. Now let me go a little bit further to explain mirages. Now uh, each um, point on an object that you're looking at uh, emits a family of rays, a collection, a bundle of rays. And a ray family has a property, a holistic property, that no individual ray possesses. It's a caustic, a focal line or surface. It's the envelope of the family. Now, here's one ray, the parabolic ray. It's parameterized by the lateral position and the vertical position where it's horizontal. So these are two parameters, and a family of rays consists of different combinations of these parameters. So, uh, for example, Parallel incident rays from a distant source all have the same reflection height, but they're parameterized just by the horizontal motion. And you can calculate the envelope. I won't go into it, but here's the pattern. And you see here's the envelope. It's horizontal in this particular case. Uh, or more realistically, rays from a point source, that's part of the object not too far away, a car or a tree or whatever you're looking at, mirage reflected at some height, um, you can calculate the caustic. It's, it's again a parabola. Each of the parabolic rays envelops a parabola. You might have seen this. This in three dimensions, it's paraboloid. It's the upside down version of the bounding paraboloid in artillery theory. If you have a gun and uh, uh, which you can fire missiles with a given speed, but you can aim the gun in different directions, what's the boundary of the region that you reach? Each trajectory is parabolic, upside down version of this picture, but the bounding region, the bounding paraboloid is itself uh, uh, of the same shape. In optics, it's the caustic. Very good. Now, of course, an object is a collection of source points. So to understand the mirage reflection of an object, you have to consider families of families of rays. And uh, so here's the distance scene. It's an extended source. Each point emits a family. Now, points on the scene whose caustic is below your eye, you see two images, one upright and one inverted. That's the mirage. Um, seen points whose caustic is above the eye, that's if your eye's down here, you don't see any mirage reflection. So the caustic has a significance. The vanishing line, which determines which part of the object is mirage reflected and which part isn't, it separates them, is the points on the scene whose caustic passes through your eye. So that's a significance of that. Now, you can simulate with a realistic model of refractive index that goes um, from one to a constant exponentially. Um, they're very, very small. This is the uh, uh, very, very small deviation of the refractive index of air from, uh, from one. Um, sorry, it goes from delta to one, let's, let's say. Now, you can calculate the rays exactly. I won't describe how. And uh, you can find the, 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 the limiting height. And you get a picture. This is one point of a scene. Now, looking from the ground, your eyes far over here, you see no images or two images. What about this transition? That's a shadow boundary because uh, the second ray here would actually hit the ground so you don't see it. So this is... Uh, this is uh, the geometry. Now, Raman and Pancharatnam gave some experiments with a hot vertical plate. And you can see uh, two images here, but you sometimes see three, a third image. And uh, this comes, or one of its explanations is, if the density is not monotonic, and it isn't always, the, the density of the air de depends on temperature inversions and, and the like, there's a picture in the famous book by Minier on optics of the atmosphere, where again, you see three uh, images. 
And how does that work? If you have a maximum of the refractive index, in other words, if it doesn't vary monotonically from ground index to index when you're higher in the atmosphere, uh, this generates a duct which can have one or more images. So you can show that the, the refractive index profile of this type generates rays of this kind, and you can have one image, three images, five images, seven images. Uh, I just want to make a comment. Uh, Raman and Pantra don't show this picture, but Raman was aware of it because quite different work, which he'd done in the 1930s and 40s, um, uh, was on the diffraction of a beam of light by a beam of sound and the variations, periodic variations of the sound correspond to a refractive index variation of the air and you get precisely this pattern in the rays that uh, propagate. So he was aware of this picture, but he didn't mention it in connection with mirages. So this works. Now, having argued mistakenly that you can't explain the mirage using geometrical optics, Rowan and Pantera say, well, yes, you can explain it, but you need wave theory. Now, of course, wave theory certainly is correct. It's a deeper level. So let's see what they discussed. They considered monochromatic waves in a refractive index medium, this is the atmosphere near the ground, it satisfies the Helmholtz equation. And they made a linear model near the uh, critical layer, um, refractive index varies linearly, uh, uh, locally, and uh, they were able to solve the Schrodinger equation. It corresponds to this particular family of rays, that's the, that's the um, uh, family that they uh, 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 considered, and they want to look at the waves near this uh, place where the rays are horizontal, near the caustic, and they were able to solve the equation. There's a sideways moving exponential, together with something that varies with height, um, uh, and locally that's the uh, ordinary differential equation describing the, the, the height, z minus zc, and uh, the exact solution was actually known by Airy in 1838, um, and it's what we now call the Airy function, and, and here it is, it's an integral, uh, and, uh, and, and this is the shape of it. There's the Airy function, you see the intensity, I call it the squarey function, so this is what uh, they predicted, and uh, intensity is the square of it, and, and here's the pattern. So this is what they uh, understood, and um, uh, they showed some experiments with a heated plate, and uh, uh, I've taken a little magnification of part of their uh, 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 picture in their paper, and it agrees very well with the theory. Now, here's a curious thing. They don't seem to have known about Aries' work. Oh, oh sorry, let, uh, before I say that, caustics are universal in wave physics. If you see a rainbow, it's a caustic of the rays emerging from a raindrop illuminated by sunshine, if the raindrops are nearly all the same size, the fringes near the uh, course are not blurred out and you see, um, uh, you can see them. This is a particularly good example. Uh, in uh, experiments in the lab with undulating bathroom window glass, you can see beautiful uh, um, uh, caustics and the airy function is everywhere. There it is, there it is, it's ubiquitous. Now, they rediscovered it in a very awkward form, a superposition of Bessel functions. This is the same function, uh, but it's rather strange that the area function was very well known by the time that uh, they wrote their paper, but still they used this uh, correct but awkward superposition, of which Jeffries, who uh, coined the phrase airy function, said Bessel functions of order one third seem to have no application except to provide an inconvenient way of expressing this airy function. And I'm gonna skip a little bit of my talk now um, because uh, I just want to say that it's a rather tricky task, but you can do it to describe the more realistic family wave corresponding to a point source, but still it's the locally the airy function and uh, I won't go into the details of this, but I'll just show you, oops, I'll just show you a picture. Uh, and here it is. And here's the geometrical caustic, but still you locally got the airy functions. It involves a related function called bi, 
and a rather subtle integral that I was very pleased uh, to uh, discover. Now, the conclusions of this part of the talk. Modeling this simple natural phenomenon, the mirage, can involve several levels, rays, families of rays, families of families of rays, or the extended object, also waves. Geometrical optics does apply, contrary to Raman, but the continuum limit of a stack of refractive index slabs is not quite straightforward. Misunderstanding of the ray physics need not prevent construction of a correct wave description, which they did. Great scientists, Raman, can make interesting mistakes. And finally, I think that what was, from other knowledge that I have, I think that uh, what was wrong, confused in the paper was Raman, what was correct was Pancharatnam. Now, just I said I'd say something about the family. Uh, I never met Raman, and unfortunately, I never met Pancharatnam. He died too young. But uh, they are two members of a very brilliant family of scientists, Indian scientists. I just mentioned also, I've met Pancharatnam's widow. He died in Oxford and she stayed there. I think she's still there. I hope she's still alive. I've met her. But there's uh, the famous Chandrasekhar of uh, astrophysics, Nobel, another Nobel Prize winner. Another Chandrasekhar, liquid uh, crystals. This is Raman's, one of Raman's nephews. Um, a very eminent crystallographer, Ramasession, and Raman's son, Radha Krishnan, who was a very distinguished uh, Indian radio astronomer. I knew all of the members of this family, except the two who, who wrote this paper. Very inspiring uh, dynasty uh, of, of scientists. Um, now I come, uh, and there's a paper which I uh, wrote about this, these matters. Now I come to mirrors, change the subject, still optics though. Oriental magic mirrors are cast and bronze mirrors, polished. They uh, were made in the Han Dynasty and several thousand years ago in China. Also, they were made subsequently in Japan. Um, they're about... Uh, 10 or 15 centimeters across. I have several such mirrors. They're made now for tourists. And they're quite good mirrors, not perfect. There's my daughter and there's some, some trees near where I uh, live. Now on the back of the mirror is a deep cast pattern. Uh, in particular one I have are the signs of the zodiac. Here it is. Um, now, why they're called magic is because of this property. If instead of looking at the mirror, looking at your face in the mirror, you look at the reflection of a distant object, let's say the sun or a, a source of light on a screen, you expect to see a, a disc of bright light. Okay, but what you do, don't expect to see is the, a ghostly image of the pattern that's on the back of the mirror. Very, very strange. I'll show you again. You see, here's the mirror, and uh, here's the pattern that you see uh, reflected. And this was very puzzling. It's why they're called magic. It was, it's probably an artifact of manufacture, which was not intended. So it was very surprising when it was discovered. Now, here we are. Now, when these mirrors were brought to the West, actually from Japan, uh, about 150 years ago, there was a lot of discussion about how they might work. There were some wrong theories to do with polarization or the light penetrates the metal somehow. No, no, not the case. It was realized quite quickly that uh, during the processes of uh, uh, manufacture, and here's another one, by the way, that I have, that during the processes of uh, manufacture and uh, um, uh, polishing, because of release of stresses, thermal stresses and the like, a very faint imprint of the pattern on the back appears on the front. So there's a relief, a, 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 a relief. Um, there were a number of papers, including uh, Sylvanus B. Thompson, who's in my university, Bristol, um, uh, in, in, in the um, late 19th century. And here's another uh, uh, picture from his, uh, uh, from his uh, published lecture. Now, so here's what 
people correctly guessed must be the case. The, a weak image of what's on the back, I've exaggerated it here, appears on the front. But there was a problem. How is it? You don't see it. I mean, you see your face clearly in the mirror. You don't see this irregularity. And yet it produces this rather striking uh, uh, pattern. So how is this image created? I've used the word image in quotes because it's not an image in the usual sense. If it were, you'd have to focus it. You'd have to move the mirror back and forth relative to the, the wall or the, where you, or the screen until it was sharp, but not the case. You see a sharp image over a wide range of distances. So it's not an image in the usual sense. So this was an optics problem and that's the problem that I solved. Uh, uh, some years ago, and I'm going to describe it to you. Now, the mirror is gently convex, and superimposed on this gentle convexity, I've exaggerated, is this uh, irregularity, which uh, is um, uh, this faint image of what's on the, on, on, on the back. Now, it's a calculation. It uses the spec law of specular refraction. I won't go into details about it. Uh, refractive index is the, 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 the convex part plus the uh, uh, image of, of the pattern on the back. There's a magnification. And then there's Fermat's principle or Archimedes in the principle of specular reflection from which you can find the ray that uh, reaches a given point having been reflected at some other point from the fixed position of the source. Never mind the details of that. Now, something that doesn't happen, but you would expect it to happen, that's more familiar, and that's focusing. Of course, if you have a perfectly concave mirror with a source at the center, uh, this will focus directly back at the source. But usually, well, every mirror has aberrations, and foci are not the sharp points that you learn about in elementary optics, they're caustic. So here's an example. Here's a surface, and here are all the different caustics. Uh, and they separate regions reached by different numbers of rays, just as with the mirage, as I described. Um, you see them uh, commonly uh, uh, in paintings, uh, David Hockney, and you see most common in a coffee cup. You see this caustic produced by reflection on the surface of the coffee from the inner surface of the, uh, of the cup. There's a source somewhere far away uh, here. Now, this doesn't happen with magic mirrors because the surfaces are far gentler. The foci are much farther away than your screen. And what you actually see is an easier to understand but almost never discussed regime of pre-focal brightening. The rays concentrate a bit before they, uh, uh, before they focus. And this concentration has a lovely property. Um, you see, by the way, uh, actually, there never is any focusing because any focusing you will get is inhibited by the gentle convexity, it will be beyond inf infinity. So the geometrical intensity on the screen, you can calculate it mathematically, but in the relevant regime, this simplifies enormously for gentle curvatures where the smallest radius of curvature is much far greater than the distance of the screen that you're looking at. And here's the answer. The geometrical optics image is very close to what I'm called the Laplacian image. The intensity is one, you would, if it were a perfectly flat mirror, plus distance times the Laplacian. That's what this uh, symbol means. You probably, many of you have learned what it is. Um, so I call this a Laplacian image of the height. Now, what is this? It, it's simply the, the, the curvature, uh, the mean curvature of the surface. It's, it's reasonable. It's a concentration of light caused by curvature. And this is the precise expression. So uh, your eye doesn't really respond clearly to this contrast, uh, 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 dependence on, on the Z. What you see is the inhomogeneity. Now, how can you test such a theory? In several ways. This has an interesting implication because the pattern on the back is a series of steps. And if you smooth the step out slightly, the Laplacian of it would, is its second derivative, its curvature, it has a bright edge 
on the low side and a dark edge on the high side. So here's a, a little, here's a step. And if you, it's a little Gaussian step or error function model. And if you calculate the Laplacian, you get this. So it's bright on the low side and dark on the high side. And that tells you that if you look at these images uh, produced by the magic mirrors, then each of the features should have a bright side and a dark side. And uh, uh, by the way, this is the same transformation that the mirror does that's used in computer science in uh, image processing for edge detection. Clearly, this process sharpens an edge, and so it makes edges easier to see. So, and indeed you do see, look, look at these little bright and dark, bright and dark. Now, to, let's zoom in to this particular um, uh, step. And you see bright and dark on the computer, you can actually smooth it up and down. There we are. And you can take a profile of it. And all this is very easy on, uh, uh, on the computer now with uh, simple software, I use Mathematica, and with a digital camera, two things that 30 years ago would have been unavailable uh, to us. But here you see bright side and dark side. And when you measure the contrast, you can see that the actual height of the steps on the mirror is just a few hundred nanometers. That's comparable with the wavelength of light, which is why you don't see it. Although the, um, uh, you don't see it, although the, uh, it produces this striking effect. I've magnified the vertical scale by 16,000 uh, to make this picture. Now, this confirms that the theory is correct but it would be good to actually see the steps on the surface of the mirror. Um, and for this, I went to uh, somebody in a nearby university, Peter Aid, whose job is testing astronomical mirrors using laser profilimetry. So I took my magic mirror to him and said, please, can you scan this with your system and see um, the hope to see the steps on the surface of the mirror? And it was very surprising what we found. You see, we chose to look at this part of the, uh, of, of, of the image. Now, a raw scan doesn't show it at all. Why? Because this is made for testing astronomical mirrors and the overall convexity completely overwhelms this delicate structure that we want to see. Now, he has clever software and he can subtract off the local curvature, but you still don't see it because what you see are the deviations of the convexity of this mirror from a perfectly spherical convexity. Of course, if it were an astronomical mirror, it would be a rather bad one. It would have aberrations. Well, I was a little bit desperate because I thought, well, why am I not seeing the pattern that I should see on the other side on the bright surface of the, of the mirror? Well, he has very clever software and he can remove more and more polynomially described um, uh, 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 features of the surface. And he had to eventually fit with a ninth order polynomial. And it's a second order one that just gives the overall curvature. Then you at last see that these uh, steps are really uh, there on the front side of the mirror. Wonderful thing, just as the theory predicts. And you can scan across, and for this particular bit, um, the variations are of the order of a micron. So we understood this uh, 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 very uh, clearly, and it was a kind of nice thing. You see, it's still rather striking uh, to, to realize that it's so hard to see this pattern on the surface of the mirror, and yet, simply by shining light on it, um, uh, and looking at this reflection on the screen, you can see very dramatically the pattern on the surface. So it's a good example of how the illumination of something, even in elementary optics, dramatically changes uh, what you see. I just want to mention that in Japan, these are called makyo images. Makyo means wonder mirror, and they're used to test the flatness of uh, silicon wafers in the semiconductor industry. You see, previously you had to aim, look with a microscope, go very close to the surface to try to see the uh, variations, but simply by shining light on and looking at the reflection on the screen, you see the irregularities uh, immediately. Very good. Now, um, 
I was, I, I showed this to David Jessen in the University of Cardiff, and he said, well, why don't we make a transmission version, Laplacian magic windows, uh, where you would have something that looked like a sheet of window glass. You could look through it and see perfectly things beyond. But uh, if you look at the transmitted image of something uh, on the ground, uh, let's say, or on the screen, uh, you would then see something similar to the magic mirrors. And uh, we collaborated with Howard Snelling and Anton Surkoff in another university to investigate this. So here's the idea. You have a glass with the variations, hugely magnified here, light being illuminated, then you look on a screen. Very good. And the prediction was, it's the same theory, except instead of one, you have refractive index minus one. Okay, well, it's fine. It's just a slight modification. So the prediction is just the same. And we thought, could we construct deliberately these mirrors? Now, we weren't the first to do so, actually. Uh, by the way, just to say, suppose you want to create a given image. You have to solve this equation to find the H, the surface, that would reproduce it. This is Poisson's equation. So it involves solving Poisson's equation. Um, now, we were not the first. People had, two people actually, quite recently, had created windows which are not magic because you can actually see the relief on the surface. So it's not quite the same regime as we're um, uh, discussing. But uh, for example, here's Matthew Brand at MIT. Here's one of his windows, and here's a, 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 a picture of an image uh, 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 on the ground produced by sunshine, and that this pattern is embodied by solving Poisson's equation in the shape of the surface. Uh, I visited a beautiful exhibition in the New York Museum of Mathematics. Um, and uh, some years ago, in which he had a series of these windows he'd created with the images of famous uh, people. Now, uh, you could see that they're not magic because you can see the variations of curvature. You shine light through and, uh, and you see these images. Another person is Mark Pauli in Lausanne. This is an image of uh, Alan Turing uh, imposed in this uh, 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 mirror. He envisages using uh, these concealed structures on the surfaces of windows, I said mirrors, I mean wind, uh, windows, uh, in architecture, to create interesting shapes. Uh, uh, as the sun moves in certain ways, you'd see strange, unexpected patterns cast on walls from behind the mirror, behind the window. Um, if you visit University of Lausanne, where he works, in the entrance to the building, there's a slowly rotating um, picture of um, one of uh, uh, one of these windows, and most orientation, you just see a pattern of caustics, but a certain orientation, suddenly um, Turing comes into view. Now, we wanted to uh, test this uh, theory and uh, to make a, a mirror which really was magic in the sense that you can't see the relief. And I wrote a theory paper simulating this is an image of my grandson, as he then was, and this is a few years ago. And uh, here's the solution of Poisson's equation, of which this is the right-hand side, this is the source. And uh, this gives you a contour map of the surface you would need, here's a 3D version, to shine light through and produce on a screen a picture of my grandson. Now, I can do it on the computer, of course, I just applied the Laplacian image to this simulation, and indeed I get a slightly pixelated version of, uh, of my uh, grandson. But what about the actual manufacture? Well, um, this is, was not very straightforward. The first thing was to see if the transmission works at all. And for this, they took an existing mirror and they made a cast of by melting plastic and uh, softened to the surface. And so you get an inverse of the, um, uh, of the surface embedded on the plastic and shining light through with a mirror whose reflection gives this Laplacian image from the plastic replica, uh, it agrees perfectly. So we know that the transmission theory works. 
The problem is, how could you, if you don't have a magic mirror, how could you construct a magic window with a pattern you choose? And it turned out to be not easy at all. There is, and some of you might know about this in optics, there's a, a, a very popular now um, area of optics called freeform optics. That's creating uh, uh, lenses with particular profiles for particular purposes. It turns out that uh, the techniques people use don't really apply straightforwardly in the regime we want, where the horizontal scales are millimeters, but the vertical scales are microns. Now, uh, so what they, they tried, direct laser ablation, that's very natural. You shine laser and you bl bl blast away bits of the surface uh, with, with, with a laser dielectric breakdown is used a femtosecond laser but this leaves a rough surface even after laser polishing on these scales it doesn't really work so instead what they're developing and now it's a successor of anton Sirkov, i don't know the very latest that devised a laser chemical hybrid i just should say that we we uh, we worked with um uh, uh, with um howard snelling because his expertise is in fact um, lasers and surfaces of, of, uh, uh, of glass. And uh, he was, uh, this was an interesting exercise for him, applying techniques and developing them to a regime which, was un, which he had not worked in before with this particular uh, horizontal and vertical scales. So the, the hybrid they'd use is, they use a femtosecond laser to modify the surface, it leaves a latent image inside involving color centers, and then hydrofluoric acid let, um, etching then produces the actual surface relief. And then uh, the, they investigated a number of parameters, the, the pulse energy and the duration, the temperature, the depth, all of this. And this is what they uh, decided, these are the first results. Hull, the city where this, in England, where this research was done, was the city of culture some years ago. And this was the logo. So they decided that they would make a magic window which would reproduce this logo shape. Well, this is the inverse Laplace uh, Poisson transform of this. Uh, tells you that if you make a window with this profile, then uh, uh, it is a computer, of course, simulation, then it would refract and produce this image uh, on a screen. Well, um, they created one. I mean, this is an approximation to, the, to, uh, to this, to this. So they, they created this and then they shone light through and uh, this is the image they desire. This is what they want. So it really works, great, but there's a problem. This is only uh, half a centimeter in size. It's a tiny window. And although it establishes the principle, it's not something you could carry around and, uh, and shine light through. And there are some technical reasons why it's difficult and, and uh, they're still working on trying to make a bigger one. So that's this part of the talk. And there are two papers uh, about this, one on the original uh, oriental um, magic mirror and one on the theory for the magic windows with the simulation of my, of my grandson. But these are theory papers. So that's uh, what I wanted to tell you, uh, two optical illusions using geometrical optics in ways which are not quite obvious. You think of geometrical optics as being something trivial. Well, it isn't. Uh, of course, the law of reflection or refraction, if it's Snell's law, are pretty elementary. They're ancient and every student knows them. But there's a large distance between uh, conceptual distance between laws and behavior. And these two examples illustrate that. I just mentioned before stopping, I just mentioned that just now, and I'm not showing this, I don't have a presentation about it. I'm working on the curiously distorted and disrupted images you see in fairground mirrors. Mirrors curved surfaces, uh, the first curve one way, then the other. Mirrors with inflections. You get, you maybe you've seen very sometimes very amusing uh, distortions of your own image, and uh, this is uh, not trivial to understand using geometrical optics. But there are certain principles involving caustics which do enable these uh, patterns to be understood. And I indeed have constructed using flexible plastic, sh shiny plastic, uh, one of these inflected mirrors and uh, made some observations, but that's not, uh, for, that's not for today. 
So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'm very happy if anybody wishes uh, to ask questions or to um, uh, make comments uh, in the few minutes that we have remaining. Now, there is a hand raised. So can I hear what you have to say? Hello, sir. I am Vikas. Yes. Basically, just I want to ask one thing like uh, you have shown the transmission, uh, basic uh, transmission window. So can we do these kind of things for 3D uh, kind of things, like uh, two images in one? That's a very good question. Point. That's a yes. very good, that's a very good question. I d actually don't know the answer. Um, At the moment, I'm a little negative about it. However, I'm well aware that the ingenuity of practical optical scientists is uh, is is very extensive. And so there may well be a way, but I don't at this moment uh, 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 see it. Indeed, the particular feature, which I mentioned in the beginning, that these are not images in the usual sense, and that the pattern you see is largely independent of where you put the screen. It's very striking when you actually observe this, uh, is uh, gives a, a rather a negative response to your suggestion. So at the moment, I don't think so. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There will be some apparitions also there. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Good. Hello, sir. I have one question. Yes. Sir, uh, you are talking about this Laplacian image. Yes. And you show this equation for the, that. But is it related to the transport of intensity equation for is generally used wave optics derivation? And they also show the same kind of images. Yes, I, I don't hear terribly well, and your voice was a little bit distorted. But I think your your what your question was about the you said the transfer equation. Say that again. The transport of intensity equation. Well, it is in geometrical optics. Of course, it is, but it's a particular case of it, uh, and it's uh, only for these very gentle deformations that you get uh, that you get the um, uh, Laplacian, which enables a, a great deal of understanding. Because without that, you would not predict that uh, you'd have the bright side and the dark side, and all of that. So, uh, of course, and, and in, just to say that uh, the people I described with the windows, Mark uh, uh, Pauli and Matt Brand, they indeed use these transfer equations and very rather complicated mathematics and uh, computer algorithms uh, to calculate the, uh, the surfaces required. I mean, it's, the, it's of course the inverse of the, of the transfer equation that they used. Um, the point about the Laplacian image is that it's a regime where everything is simple and understandable. So it's an approximation, clearly very accurate for the cases considered, to these more general transfer uh, e e e equations. And of course, some of these transfer equations involve waves, they involve diffraction, and uh, you don't see any of that uh, in, this, um, in these images. And by the way, I didn't mention it, uh, uh, people have often asked, uh, what about wave effects? And in my original paper, I give a calculation showing that they're really pretty negligible in, uh, in the phenomena I've been describing. It really is just geometrical optics. Is that okay? So I think there is one question from Kedar, sir. Yeah, uh, this is Kedar Khare. Uh, unfortunately, my camera is not working right now, but... Uh, it's okay, I can hear you. <laughs> so uh, you said that, uh, you know, in these magic mirrors, uh, you need a point source. Uh, so what is the reason for that? Is it a special coherence or...? The reason for what was the for needing a the reason point, for using a point source? In oh, case. because if it, otherwise the pattern is blurred. That's all. I mean, a flashlight is good enough. I mean, the sun is not a point; it's half a degree, but that's that's small enough to see uh, these yeah. patterns very clearly if you go outside in the sunshine and then you you shine the reflected image on a wall. You see it very okay. clearly. So, so it, it it just has to be a small source. I mean, a, a, a nice LED flashlight, to, and one of these little um, uh, 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 keys that you have on your key ring, little torches that you have on your key ring are perfectly good enough to, to, uh, yeah. to show the pattern. So it just uh, has to be small, that's all. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, any other question from the panelist? Yeah, just a small query related to these magical mirrors. Yes. So, uh, what is the actual composition of these mirrors? Are these metal? Uh, they're bronze. They're bronze. Bronze mirrors. Bronze mirrors, and uh, it's it's interesting how they're made. They're made by casting um, uh, from a mold, and then they're polished vigorously. At least uh, some of the Japanese ones. I don't know about the original. They're polished vigorously with hard wood being rubbed back and forth. And it's probably during this process, the cooling and the vigorous polishing, that the cooling and the release of elastic stresses in ways that I've never seen described precisely, would cause the big, deep relief pattern on the back to be very weakly reproduced on the front. It is a very deep relief pattern. It's uh, sometimes uh, steps about half the size, half the thickness of the mirror. I mean, it really is uh, strong. So you would expect all kinds of stress release effects and, to be produced, but I don't know the details. I don't think anybody does, oh. but bronze anyway. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so now let's move to the question uh, to attendees. Uh, is, there, is there any question from the attendees? You can type your question in Q&A box. Okay, so there is one question from uh, Bhargav Ram. Uh, uh, any application in space related activities? Say that, say that again slowly, I didn't hear clearly. Uh, any application in space related activities? Which activities? I missed the... Space related activities. Space related? I, not, not to my knowledge. I mean, they may well be because there's a huge amount of optics in, uh, in, 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 in involved in space exploration, you know, cameras and telescopes and whatever. But I don't know of any. Uh, the only application I know, is, uh, which I mentioned, was in this semiconductor industry in Japan to test the, the flatness, uh, the perfection of the flatness of uh, mirrors. They want to see the absence of these features that I've uh, been uh, describing. And someone else has asked a question. Um, for seeing a transparent cell using a microscope, a slight defocus helps. Is this, is this related to the magic mirror? That's interesting. I don't know the answer. Um, I, I, I don't see any relation, but because um, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, what you have in mind, I suspect, is what I said, which is that the point about the magic mirror is not focusing in the usual sense because there are no caustics. I mean, caustics is a big area of, of study in optics nowadays, but it's not an area that applies to these magic mirrors, precisely the opposite. So uh, the answer is, I don't know whether it's related to defocusing to look clearly at things. So, is there any other question? No, sir, I have one more question. Like, mm -hmm. basically, uh, we are uh, uh, basically introducing these uh, Langrangian optics, basically. So, uh, what are the what are different types of uh, softwares we are using for these kind of... Uh, oh, Mathematica. Yes, I use Mathematica and I, yeah. I don't use any programs. I just write my own. It's because it, it's, it's quite elementary. And uh, so, for example, there, of course, there are ray tracing programs, but for, uh, I, it would take me more time to learn to use a ray tracing program than to write my own for this particular case. You know, it's, just it's, I want to ask what uh, what are you doing in phase standing of things like phase propagations for that particular uh, thing for that, you know, in that transmission windows or transmissions. Um, you mean you you do, yes, you, you mean to do a, a wave theory analysis? So, well, yes, sir. Yes, sir. It, well, you write a diffraction integral, and I have many papers discussing diffraction integrals in different uh, uh, in different uh, settings, for example, near caustics and whatever. But for this uh, magic mirror in the original paper, uh, two thousand and six, I uh, used uh, the 
the Fresnel Kirchhoff integral for propagation to show that wave effects are not important. You know, so. so, so we are also using this uh, Kirchhoff's uh, that uh, kind of things. Using uh, Kirchhoff's relay uh, equation for the diffraction. Well, I'm just Kirchhoff. Yeah, yes, Kirchhoff. Yeah, I mean, yes, Kirchhoff-Fresnel diffraction. It's enough to use the paraxial approximation to it because okay. all the rays are going in 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 directions which are very uh, small compared to the. Okay, the so we are we are so, taking the paraxial paraxial yeah, kind of. Approach. It's so it's paraxial. Uh, Fresnel Kirchhoff uh, diffraction, yeah, uh, yeah integral, thank you, integral. But as I say, you don't need it for this phenomenon. It's much more elementary. Yes, yeah. thank you, sir. Good. Yeah, Fargo, sir. Sir, you are you are unmuted. Yeah, one second. Uh, now I am audible. Yes, yes. Yeah. Professor Berry, um, yes. this, uh, how these magical mirrors are different from phase conjugate mirrors? Well, not related at all, because phase conjugate is essentially a, a technique that works using the using wave physics. And this is ray physics, so it's completely different from uh, from phase conjugation method. The phase, of course, light, light, is, a, is, light is a wave, uh, uh, but it's good enough to regard it in a geometrical optics approximation. I mean, after all, we have to think uh, uh, clearly about this. Um, geometric is an approximation. Waves are an approximation to quantum optics, of course. I mean, really, what you've got are uh, a, 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 a detections of photons uh, uh, according to the laws of quantum optics. But again, wave physics is a good approximation to that when you've got many photons. And when the wavelength is small compared to the irregularities, geometrical optics is an approximation to that. And of course, I haven't considered polarization which is another level of optics and plays no part in, in this phenomenon. So it's a very good way to think about different levels of description in, in, in optics. And the phase is irrelevant to this. Yeah, uh, once that uh, mirror, that magical mirror is made, then obviously the waves or light or whatever it is falling onto the mirror, it doesn't know whether we are using geometrical optics or the wave optics. Uh, that's where I was having this doubt whether uh, these magical mirrors also can be used for phase conjugation uh, kind of. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. The, whether you can actually use these images. Of course, the waves are there, no doubt. And if you use a coherent source, not unlike the sun, um, then, uh, uh, well, uh, there may be a way to exploit these um, uh, the, the phase of the waves in these patterns. I don't know. Uh, I haven't thought about that, so there may be an application there. That's I, I know I understand you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, so uh, I think so, so. I think there is no question. Uh, so. Uh, so I request all the panelists uh, to turn, turn on uh, their camera so we can take a digital photo. Sorry, I don't understand that. Mm. Yeah, for a digital photo, we want everyone to turn, off, oh, okay. turn on their camera. Okay, thank you. So I can leave now. So, so on behalf of IIT Delhi, yes. of OST and SPY, I would like to thank Sir Michael Mary for such an intriguing and informative talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you thank very you. much for your hospitality. Bye bye. Bye.